Hi, everyone. Welcome to Copper Hill Church, week two. In these extraordinary times in history, when we are unable to physically assemble because of COVID-19, we have chosen this means to gather together. In this way, we will be able to continue to encourage one another in our Christian discipleship and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together. I'm Pastor Calvin Jones, and this is my wife, Joanne. Hello, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our service from our dining room table. And uh, we'd like to especially thank our tech guys, uh, Corey Schantz and Jonathan Griffin, for making this possible. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to share the link with someone, that would be great. We're striving to make virtual church more interactive each week. And we're listening to the feedback we received and working on improving our formatting every week. Our goal is still to help you connect with God's word, spend time together in prayer and devotion, and find encouragement together. And we depend upon the promise of God that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Wherever or however the people of God gather together, we have that promise that Jesus will be with us by his Holy Spirit. So let's begin today with a scriptural call to worship, as we usually do at church. We'll read together responsively. I will read, and then Joanne will read, and you can read with us from the screen. The Lord reigns forever. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. A stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Well, since it is the nature of the family of God to sing, we try to sing at least one song on virtual church. Singing brings joy, I believe. And today our song is Be Strong in the Lord. It's a scripture-based song that Joanne wrote. And I think most of you know the words. So let's sing together. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Let's sing again. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's feet. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, prayer is an essential part also of what we do every week at Copper Hill Church. We remember that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And prayer is the key to keeping that mindset. Joanne, what's been happening this week in the prayer scene? Well, last week, many of you contacted us with prayer requests. Uh, some of you emailed, some of you uh, Facebook. So whatever prayer requests you would like us to pray for, please connect and, and send them to us. And uh, we, we will be praying for them. The request last week we did send out to our prayer team, so they are being prayed for. And uh, one thing uh, we want to make sure you have, if you did not get the 12 scripture prayers, these are uh, verses of comfort that we'd like to send to you. Uh, either by email or Facebook. So let us know if you would like these 12 scripture prayers of comfort and we will send them to you. 
All right, let's pray together. And while we pray, Joanna is going to play her harp for us again. As we begin our prayer time, most of us do not spend quiet time before God. And so when we meet as a church, we need to practice doing that. And I invite you to prepare your hearts before God through confession and intercede for personal requests that you have during these moments. Gwen, would you play for us? the psalm writer, you have spoken to your people of every age who worship the God of Abraham, saying, I am your God. Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. We come to you today in a time of distress for our nation and for our world a time unlike any that our world has seen in a hundred years. We cry out to you for mercy upon us and upon our world. And even as we have reports that the COVID virus has moved into our area, Lord, teach us to have a humble heart before you so that we can seek your face with clean hands and a pure heart. We lift up before you in our prayer, those most afflicted by the virus. Please comfort those who grieve in our country and other countries. Please fortify in health those such as healthcare workers who are on the front lines of caring for others, those who are most vulnerable and those who are already ill. Please give those whose work continues among amid added stresses, courage and strength from you. Father, we pray for families and parents whose everyday routines have been upended. By your spirit, may they hear the whispers of your voice guiding them in the new circumstances of their daily lives. We pray for those who have lost income. Oh God, please give them your strength and help to survive this crisis. And may we be instruments of your peace and your help to encourage others as we have opportunity. And in this Lenten season, we remember that Jesus endured deep suffering for us, so he understands our sufferings. May we ever remember the promise of Holy Scripture where he assures us, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Oh God, our Father, each of us has people individually that we would mention to you too this morning, and we pray for them. May they draw close to you. May they find your grace more than sufficient for their needs. And may we who have confessed faith in Jesus our Savior remember in this time to take time for prayer. We pray all together now, as Jesus has instructed us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, well, today we have the privilege of hearing from our lay leader at Copper Hill Church, Robert Loomis. Hi, Robert. 
Robert has been spearheading what we call our In Touch ministry, and today he's going to share one of his signature history moments with us. Well, in the beginning of the 17th, the early 1700s, 1730s, the Industrial Revolution was beginning. And people were moving from the country into the city to work in the factories. And many of them were feeling lost. Um, they felt like they were just a cog in the system. Um, ale houses were growing by leaps and bounds. And food riots were there because food prices had gone up. And that um, it wasn't going up with the same. And um, wages were not going up to keep track. So in that light, George Whitfield um, came. He was the great evangelist of the time. He came to Bristol, um, England to, um, to preach to the people. He started out with a crowd of 200. Uh, it quickly grew to 10,000. Now he could speak to these people without amplification. He didn't need computers. He didn't need uh, amplifiers. He just had the voice and he had the drama and he was the evangelist that drove people there. But he realized that you needed something else other than this great crowd of people to keep people on track. So he called his friend and colleague from the Holy Club in, that he'd gone to college with, John Wesley. So John Wesley comes and he tries to make an organization. Now societies had been a common form of organization. The Holy Club was a society inside the church. But within a, a couple of years, John Wesley realized that the societies were not working. He needed something in addition to that. So he he uh, took from his Moravian experience and he invented the concept of a class meeting. So in, in 1742, he started the class meetings and this was a, normally a group of 12. And originally it was a matter of, of getting a leader and then he would be checking on his 11 other people to see how they were doing in their Christian walk. But because of the overcrowdedness and the and the difficult conditions, he, they soon realized that what they needed to do was meet together. And in this meeting together, with the 12 people meeting together, they naturally understood what their burdens were and uh, um, how to help each other. So by these small groups, by bearing each other's burdens, by helping each other out, they were able to achieve what Wesley had always wanted to do, which was to go back to those biblical principles in Acts and to see the growth of the church, those types of self-help, those types of caring for each other naturally appeared out of these groups of 12. He also had what he called the band, and the band was just of, of six people. And this was based on uh, James 5.16, where he talks about uh, confessing to one another. And in the Catholic Church, they went to a confessional. Um, what, what Wesley was saying was with these six people, they could confess to each other. So th with this organization, Wesley was trying to get the Christian spirit in the early church, or what he called the primitive church. And to get back to that early church spirit, uh, it needed more than the great evangelists like, like Whitfield. It needs more than, than our, our great pastor, Calvin Jones. What he says was it needed that church unity and people talking to, with each other. And now we've come to a time when that's, we can't actually see each other because they, they're not going to let us. Uh, so we, we need to find new ways to be able to get together. We need to use the telephone more efficiently, maybe WebEx, uh, Zoom. We have other modes of communication, but to keep that early church spirit alive means that we communicate, we're looking out for each other. Um, you know, of course, you're particularly looking out for those with a cough or a fever, but, um, and, and you also want to keep your own immune system strong with your vitamin C and getting up. But the, you also want to keep those stress levels low. And we keep those stress levels low by prayer. And as it says in James 5.16 at the end, it says the prayer of a good person has a powerful effect. So I'll stop. Calvin will do the announcements now. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Robert. That was awesome. And Robert and uh, those in our outreach committee are 
working to keep in touch with people in our congregation. And that's one reason I asked him to share this today so that you would know that Robert's at work, uh, helping to keep in touch with you in our congregation. And that's a part of our ministry during this uh, COVID-19 uh, time. Now we have some announcements for you today. First of all, uh, Bishop Bickerton, our presiding bishop, has directed all our area churches to continue to meet online for at least an additional Sunday, which means we'll be doing this again next week on March 29th. So remember, no Bible studies uh, this week or next, and the confirmation class, which was supposed to be held today, will not be held. And... Um, <clears throat> I wanted to let everyone know that there's a new prayer movement going on, new to me anyway. I guess we're calling it the uh, 8 p.m. Central Prayer. This is where everyone across the United States is praying for our country for one minute at 8 p.m. Central or here on the East Coast, it would be 9 o'clock. If you're on the West Coast, it would be 6 o'clock. So we're praying for our country for one minute. And we have a sheet we'd like to send to you to help you in your prayers for our country. It's called Scripture Prayers of, of Repentance and Reflection. And there's a section on the sheet that is just prayers for our country. They're all based on Scripture, and you can read the prayers if you don't know what to pray. Read the prayers, and it's prayer asking God to forgive our country for our sins and to renew us and to bring revival for our land. So this is an exciting prayer movement. All right, so if you keep in touch with us uh, by, by email, um, we can uh, email that back to you. Um, for those who would like to give to our church, you can mail contributions to Copper Hill United Methodist Church, Box 422, East Granby, Connecticut, 06026. I will be on the screen for you there, and I'll read it again. That's Copper Hill United Methodist Church, Box 422. East Granby, Connecticut, 06026. Uh, we appreciate your continued uh, faithfulness in your giving during this time. Our financial team will also be working on additional plans to facilitate your generous contributions to our ministry. Uh, we're working on that, and we'll let you know as those plans progress. Now, today's scripture is from Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, you know, before I read that, uh, I forgot to read this quote that I wanted to share with you all. This is from a book called Secrets of the Secret Place. It's by Bob Sorge, and it's a great book about enriching your prayer life. And here is the suggestion he gives us. He says, start your day with just loving him. Your requests can wait. Your Bible study can wait. Your intercessions can wait before anything else. Give your love to the Lord. Let him know that love is the greatest motivator of your heart and say, here I am, Father, because I love you. You are the center of my universe. I hallow and reverence your name. I enjoy being with you. That was an encouraging quote to me. So our scripture for today is Hebrews chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, you can read along or read off the screen. Verse one, now faith, is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And verse six, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself, barren, was able to become a father because he considered him faithful who made the promise. Okay. And so from this one man, 
and he is good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands of the seashore. Well, thank you, Joanne. Well, to say that we live in difficult times is certainly an understatement. <laughs> but we're here this morning to talk about one of the most powerful tools that Christians have for dealing with the news, for dealing, for coping in a healthy way with the situation in which we find ourselves. And that tool is faith. It's the, the capacity that we have to believe in the promises of God, the ability to choose and act in ways that take into account God's actions, even though God's actions are often invisible to our eyes. The Bible has an entire chapter dedicated to the roll call of the heroes of faith in the Old Testament. It's that Hebrews 11 that Joanne read from just a few moments ago. Why was this chapter written? Well, it's really a continuation of the encouragements to faith that you find in chapter 10. For example, in chapter 10, verses 23, 22 and 23, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And the writer continues by encouraging the readers to persevere and to, quote, live by faith, unquote. Then chapter 11 opens with the definition of faith. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. And what follows in chapter 11 is a recounting of the Old Testament heroes of faith, sort of a top 10 list of the people who believed God and changed history because they had faith and acted in accordance with the words of God. Now Francis Schaeffer, in his book, Two Spirituality, sort of put it in perspective for us. He says, you know, it really doesn't matter whether you don't believe in the supernatural or whether you believe in it and don't think you can draw on it. The practical result is the same. You see, most of us talk like we believe in God, but in times of crisis, well, do we act like we do? It's sometimes difficult for us to truly have faith and to act like our belief makes a difference in what we say and what we do. So we want to think about how can we have faith that surmounts a crisis? So it's not just something that we believe in our head, it's something that we see in our lives. We right. in our lives. It makes a difference in what we do. Right. What kind of faith is that? What does that faith do? Well, first of all, that kind of faith keeps us connected with God's unseen realities. You know, I was, as I was preparing this message, I remembered a devotional book that was written by a college friend of mine, Dave Venable. Dave has been through difficult times in his life. Uh, when he was overseas uh, in missionary service, he uh, was afflicted with Gillian Barr, and he spent some time uh, paralyzed from the neck down. And, but he did recover, thankfully. Recently, he is, uh, was in a serious bicycle accident, uh, and he is slow recovering from that. But... And the Facebook post that his wife and his daughter put on, uh, they are filled with the kinds of faith that are described in the things that he wrote in his book, Living by Faith. Here's a smart, short quote from it. He says, to a large degree, faith is a decision. If we decide to speak faith, it will grow in our hearts. Our mouth and our hearts are tied together. And whatever we speak, we start believing. And whatever we believe, we start speaking. There's a lot of truth in that because we have a choice because we follow the Christ of Easter. Jesus rose from the dead and that changed everything. Faith in him changes our perspective. It replaces gloom and doom with possibilities and the power of love. Faith acknowledges the creative power of God. Here in Hebrews it says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Faith believes in the universe-sustaining action of the ascended Christ. Here in Hebrews, in chapter 1, it says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Faith 
is certain that the unseen Heavenly Father hears when we pray. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. It is Christian faith that understands that what we see now is actually temporary and that God is preparing a realm that is unseen. Faith knows that God does not balance all his books in this world. So Paul wrote, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So what you're saying is what is really more important is the unseen, the eternal things. Right. That's what gives us grounding in, in our thinking. And, and, and when we have faith, we take that into account. And when we don't have faith, we don't even think about that. We are completely focused on the material and on the physical and on the immediate needs that we have. And given, having the faith perspective, thinking about God and thinking about his perspectives and thinking about the, the realm that he, the realm of the spirit gives us a totally uh, new dimension to think about. So we need to change our focus more from the physical things and focus more on God. Right, because right. Because God's in control. Right, and that's what faith does for us. Yes. See, faith changes our actions. Uh, today, uh, scripture, the scripture focused on Abraham. And Abraham was noted for two things. He was noted, first of all, for being a man of faith. But secondly, he was noted as a man of obedience because he had faith and because he listened to God and he obeyed God and he did some things that he wouldn't have done if he hadn't been a, a man of faith in God. As a result of his strong faith, he left his homeland and journeyed all the way to Canaan. He believed God when God promised him that he would become the father of many nations, even though at that point he didn't even have a child. And Abraham trusted God that the land upon which he was sojourning would belong to his descendants. Moses followed the legacy of Abraham's faith. Moses believed that God would send divine aid as he led the children of Israel out of slavery. Moses' successor, Joshua, had faith to lead the people of Israel as they entered the promised land and the walls of Jericho came down. It's people like these that have given us inspiration to face the challenges that confront us today with faith. And our current situation with COVID-19 and all its ramifications requires that we continue to have faith in God to be with us right. day by day. Yes. And how will our faith help us to surmount this time of crisis? Well, most of the time, the result of faith is not shown by some miraculous event, as it was in the case of Old Testament heroes, though sometimes it is. But instead, most of the time, it's evidenced by day-to-day -day choices that we make and actions that we choose. Here's another thought from my friend Dave. Sometimes an unexpected difficulty arises, and we are tempted to release words that are not of faith. Ooh, I had to eat this this week. This preached to me this week. <laughs> we need to remember that we have faith and then release words accordingly. Mm -hmm. The bigger the problem, the bigger the faith we need. We have faith. We have confessed that Jesus is Lord. We have confessed that he always takes care of us. We have confessed that he has our ultimate good in mind. So let us remember these facts at our most stressful moments, most tempting moments, most painful moments, and confess our faith then, too. Boy, that's a challenging word, isn't it? Sure. You know, faith relies on God. Faith feeds on God's word. You know, finally, it's the very nature of faith that it causes us to stop depending on ourselves and instead to put our trust in God's strength. Because here in our country, we're taught self-reliance and self-confidence oh, yeah. is a good thing. But in the situation we're facing now, we really need to lean not on our own understanding because we don't have any uh, and lean on God. Right. Trust in him with all our hearts. Absolutely. If there's anything that we're going to learn from this COVID-19, it may be the limits of our self-reliance. The Bible teaches us that all our abilities ultimately come from God, and faith teaches us to rely completely on God's strength and his guidance to truly thrive. We need that message from God that we receive when we read and study his holy word. 
The Bible says, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So one way we gain faith is through God's word. It is not just the records of God's actions in scripture that help us either, but also the testimony of one another. That's another reason for keeping in contact with one another. We need to hear the encouragement of how God is helping and encouraging other people day by day. For the testimonies of others are part of the encouragement that keep our faith strong. Another thing faith does is overcome our doubts. Everyone has doubts from time to time. But if we feed our doubts, they'll only get bigger. You know, I, I knew a Salvation Army pastor once who had a pet snake, and it was one of those that can grow quite large. And uh, so I asked him about that one day. I said, so how do you can keep the snake from getting really big? And he said, well, I'll tell you a secret. He said, if you have a pet snake like this, you don't feed it very much. <laughs> uh, I guess reptiles are like that. The more food you feed them, the bigger they get. Well, that's sort of like our doubts. The more we feed them, the bigger they grow. But when we feed our souls on the word of God, then our faith grows. And then our faith squelches our doubts. Paul wrote, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Difficult times in our lives seem to make it hard for us to be strong in faith. Yet those are exactly the times when we need to trust God and allow our faith in him to squelch the doubts that, come, that inevitably creep in. And I think that's where encouraging each other helps, Absolutely. especially if we're using God's word. If someone is concerned about their material needs or their future, we can say, my God will, will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus, which is a scripture verse. It's very encouraging. Right, right. And, and that's where our scripture memory it comes in because uh, some of you have told me that you've been using the verses you memorize to quote to other people in conversations. Right, right. That word is great for that. Another thing that faith will help us with in these kind of times, it brings us comfort. That's one of the things that we need. We need that comfort and that peace in our hearts and minds. And having faith in God uh, brings that. And Joanne found a really good quote uh, this week. This is from my daily devotional. It's by Charles Stanley, and it's called Pathways to His Presence. And this was March 19th, just a few days ago. Um, he said, maybe you are going through a time right now when you feel so barraged by hardship that your life hardly seems worth the pain. Walking in victory seems like an illusion. While you endure suffering, looking to the Lord for comfort, remember one thing. God initiated a relationship with you. Therefore, he initiates his comfort for you too. All right, and that's his promise in the scripture that he will send us comfort. Yes. When we have faith in God, we can reach out uh, to God for our needs, for his peace and for his comfort. You see, faith treasures the promises of God and uses them in the diff difficult situations that we find. Faith and the promises of God are a powerful combination Treasuring God's promises will help us to thrive spiritually and to be able to surmount the challenges that we face. And I, as, as we close today, I want us to pray the promises of God. I have three here that I'm going to close with, and then a couple, we'll use a couple also from uh, the sheet that Joanne has prepared as we close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you have taught us that you are able to make all grace abound to us so that in all things, at all times, having all that we need, we can abound in every good work. We don't know how that applies in these difficult times, but we ask you to help us to trust in your holy word and to have faith in your ability to strengthen us in our time of need. We thank you for the promise you have given us in your holy word that you will give strength to the weary that you will increase the power of the weak yes. that even when youths are tired and weary and young people stumble and fall those who hope in the lord can renew their strength and soar on wings like eagles they can run 
and not grow weary and walk and not be faint. Thank you, Lord, that according to your holy word, your grace is sufficient for us in every human circumstance, for your power is made perfect in our weakness. Thank you, O God, that we can find comfort in your words. You said, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. For I am the Lord your God. We are so grateful for the strength that you give to your people. Oh, you, oh Lord, you bless us with peace. And the word peace in Hebrew has to do not only with peace. It is the word shalom and has to do with wholeness as well. Thank you, Lord, for your wholeness, for your blessings upon your people. Well, may God be with all of you today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to stay in touch. We love you all and we're there for you.